Will you pray with me? Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you guys ever been, I can't, I've got this bright light and I can't really see out to see you. Have you ever been in the minority in a, in a situation? Have you? I had really not much. I, as, a, as a white woman in the United States speaking English, I have always been in the majority, although I didn't really always realize it. But I had a couple things happen that showed me what it's like, a little bit, just that little teeny bit of empathy. One of them was traveling. Just as Christians, I think that it opens our eyes and our hearts to travel and to see people and to, to have this new compassion. But when I've traveled in countries where they don't speak English, that is such a vulnerable feeling. Trying to mime, I have to go to the bathroom, you know, and then talk about vulnerable. And then people are always really lovely about, well, there were, it was that time that I got sent to, uh, no, but no, that's not right. I was, it's always been that people have been wonderful. Um, I remember on a, I, I, I was on a train trying to get to the airport and I had my bags and this woman kind of looked at me and she was trying to mime like, are you going to fly? And finally I understood what she was doing and I was like, yes, I am heading to the airport, you know, and she was like, no, not this train. But she had to do it all in miming. I was on the whole wrong train. And she saved me and she got off with me and went to another platform and helped me and all of it just with hands. That feeling, it's a vulnerable feeling when you're the one that doesn't speak the language. The other experience I had with that, some of you may have heard me tell this before, this was a big deal. I was at this training. It was a fire department training in Phoenix. There were a whole bunch of firefighters. Most of the time, trainings, ah, eh, you know. But this one, there were a couple of things that happened, and one of them was this exercise. There was a bunch of us, and we were all standing in the center of a big room. Like, you can picture it here, like you know, everybody's standing in the center. And the leader said, all right, I'm going to make a statement. Like, uh, the sun is hot. If you strongly agree, you run to that corner. Agree disagree, strongly disagree. So I'll read the statement, the sun is hot, and go. And we practiced it once, we had it down, we were all strongly agreeing, you know, with the sun is hot. But then they got more tricky, and it was things like, um, homosexuality is a sin. Like a lot of controversial things, we moved up through it. And we got to this one set of questions, Everybody was just running. We were really listening for the statement and then running to our corner and not paying a lot of attention to anybody else. And so this one statement got read, and I go running to my corner. My corner was strongly disagree. And then when I kind of looked, I was the only person on that entire side of the room. There was nobody else, and all these other people were over there all looking at me. They were really just waiting for the next statement to see where to run, but I felt like they were all looking at me, and I wanted to hide behind a rock. I had this feeling like prey, and they were all hawks, and it was just this incredibly vulnerable, uh, frightened kind of deep experience, and it really showed me how vulnerable it can be to be in a minority group. That's not because those people weren't out to get me, but it kind of felt like that because I was different in that moment. Well, a week ago Friday, we all here at Genesis had the opportunity to go to the mosque here in Fort Worth and to break the fast with them. During the month of Ramadan, Muslims fast. I mean, seriously fast, no water, no nothing, from sun up to sundown. But at sundown, they all, every single night, they all gather at the mosque and they break their fast together and eat together. And they have this community. And so this Friday, they invited neighbors and they invited us. And we had, I think, close to 39 people from Genesis that went. And a number of people said to me, you know, I just feel uncomfortable. I feel kind of scared to, to go, you know, with these times that we're in. And I understood that completely. And on the day of, I felt a little like, is this a good thing to be doing? You know, I'm taking my kids. Is, is this realizing that those folks could be targeted? But we went. 
And as we drove in, they have a big fence around their property. And so we drove in through the gate, and there was a young man. We found out the youth of the mosque were the ones that were welcoming us. And this young man was at the gate, and he was smiling. And I sometimes, when I'm nervous, I do this thing where I wildly overcompensate. And so I was like, hello, you know, we're so glad to be here. And I, thought, I know he thought we shouldn't let her in. <laughs> but... Um, we got out of the car and walked through and they greeted us outside. And then when we got in, um, there was this beautiful young woman. I don't know how old Reem was, but she had on a head covering with sparkles. And then her dress was this beautiful pink. And both of my girls were just entranced by Miss Reem. She was a princess and it was beautiful. And she showed us all around. And then we had an opportunity to hear from some of the folks at the mosque about their experience, about ways in which our faith is similar to theirs, ways in which we could cooperate. Um, they read a piece from the Quran that was about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so there was this, it was neat, it was amazing. The whole thing was great. We got a chance, if we wanted, no pressure, to go and pray with them. And then they gave us this meal that was unbelievable. They, it was all handmade, falafel, and all these beautiful things. And it was the warmest, most hospitable, beautiful experience. And it was an interesting thing to get to do. I felt so blessed and grateful. But that experience of going to the mosque got me thinking about America as we're in this 4th of July weekend, this country of ours. I am not a Native American. My people came from Germany and Wales and Ireland and who knows, I'm a mutt, you know, like a lot of people. So we came from somewhere else to come here. People came to this country for all kinds of reasons. Some of them came because they thought it was a way to make money. Some came for empire. Some came because they wanted to be able to worship their own way. Some came because it was a choice between that or prison. All these different reasons why people came. And that's part of the American experiment, is that folks have come in and found a way with all these different priorities to live together. And now we've had people coming from all over parts of the world to come here and to live together. That's sort of what America is, is it's a place where we can learn and grow stronger Now, what's interesting about this to me is that a lot of times growing up, and even now, I hear people talk about America is a Christian country. Okay, and on one level, just on the basic factual level, that's not true. We have Christians, we have Jews, we have Muslims, we have every world religion represented, and there are people that have no faith. And there are people who have a strong faith that there's no God. You know, there's a distinction there. Um, all of them are here. All of them are citizens. And every one of them American. So on that level, it's not correct to say we're a Christian country. But as I thought about this, I thought, you know, there's another level in where it maybe is correct. And that's this idea of reaching out beyond ourselves, reaching out across barriers and boundaries to know one another. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus, over and over again, was getting in trouble because he would eat with sinners, that, you know, that the establishment called sinners. He was helping people on the Sabbath day. He was reaching across to lepers who were considered unclean. On and on and on. Our example in our Lord Jesus is that he was reaching across to people that were outcasts or on the borders eating with them, bringing them in, showing them love. And so in that sense, we are a Christian country because in living together, we have this model of reaching out and getting to know in your workplaces, in school, there are going to be all kinds of people that are different. And we make it work. Or we try to. When Jesus said we're to love one another, there were no exceptions. He went so far as in our text today to say love your enemies so it's not just love the people there's no there is no verse anywhere of Jesus saying therefore ye shalt love those just like you with whom you feel most comfortable no it isn't in fact we're supposed to stay a little bit uncomfortable but it's hard it's hard to do but 
that way, um, we, we, are, we are showing what it is to be Jesus Christ in the world. I've been really surprised at a number of people who have said, not from this church, but from others who have said, why would you go to a mosque? Some people saying they were Satanists. That is not true. Some people saying that, um, well, some people really feeling that there was danger. And let me tell you about that. You know, here at Genesis, we don't have a big fence around the property so that we can stay safe. And in the mosque, there were big posters that told everyone what to do in case of an active shooter. We don't have those at Genesis either. Just in case you want to know, it said it right there. You call 911, you go into a room, you turn off the light, you shut the door and lock it, and you get against the wall as far as you can so you can't be seen from the window. That just makes me want to cry that they need those put up because there is a real risk. Also, we don't quite understand what happened with this, but someone had driven a car in and parked it front and center right at the front doors of the mosque that was covered in a bunch of hateful bumper stickers. I am so naive. I thought, well, maybe that person came because they want greater understanding and, you know, and maybe they've been changed by this beautiful experience. Well, no, that's not what happened. Apparently, a person drove the car in, parked it there with all of its hateful stuff, and then ran away to, I guess, get the car later. But they go through that sort of stuff all the time. They are actually the vulnerable ones. Just the other day in Istanbul in the airport, terrorist attack, that was Muslims that were killed. And the other people that were in the airport moving through may not have all been, but the attack was on Muslims. Last night, 80 people were killed in Baghdad in a terrorist attack. Those are Muslim people. So this idea that the Muslims are, are after us, the Muslims tend to be the ones who are vulnerable. They're vulnerable in this country and they're vulnerable around the world. I had a transgender woman come into my office recently to talk about what she's going through and the burden on her heart because it is a hard path to walk. And she was saying, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. This isn't anything I chose. And we talked about the whole bathroom thing that's going on. The factual reality, if you look up the numbers, is that transgender people are far more likely to be the victims of other people's intolerance, abuse, harassment, and violence than the transgender people are ever going to be violent to us. The victims are the transgender people. That's what every bit of data shows us, that they are very, very vulnerable. So we're in, these, we're in these difficult times where we're getting confused. And I think what's happening is that a whole lot of people all around the world, not just here, have been in the majority and they're feeling that that's maybe changing and that's threatening. And I think we can all understand that. We're all human beings. We can understand. But as Christians, we have to somehow with God's grace leap over that discomfort and in fact even step into a little bit of discomfort always saying I'm not going to fall prey to this inside of me we saw with Brexit vote right after this wave of racism in the United Kingdom and we see it happening here people spitting vitriol at other people ugly ugly kinds of stuff so we're the example. We're the ones who can say we're just not going to allow that. And then that's kind of what it is to be American, and it's what it is to be Christian. But it's not always comfortable. Jesus never promised us that anything is going to be comfortable. But he did say that it's going to be worth it. I heard a story this week that I want to share with you that I think kind of sums this up. This is a true story about a rabbi. He's still alive. His name's Michael Weiser. He had moved from New York to Nebraska. And they had gotten their house. He and his wife, Julie, and their kids had gotten their house. And one of the first days they were there, there was a call on their message machine, a male voice saying, you're going to be sorry you moved into that house, Jew boy, and hung up. So the rabbi called the police and told them what happened, and they listened to the voice, and they said, we think we know who this is. It's a guy named Larry Trapp. He's the head of the KKK here in Nebraska. 
And what you need to do is make sure that when your kids are walking to and from school that they take different routes so it can't be predictable. Can you imagine as a parent hearing the police say you've got to have your kids walk different routes? I think, well, I would just say, well, my kids will never walk to school. You know, it's, it's, it's not okay. So the next thing that happened was that this rabbi got a big package in the mail and it was filled with racist material of all kinds. There was a piece of uh, a flyer with Martin Luther King's face on it and a gun sight on his forehead. And the piece said, our dreams have come true. And there was all these things, but he said the most chilling of all was a business card for the KKK that said on the back, we are watching you scum. Well, that just made the rabbi feel kind of mad and he decided he wanted to do something about it and he was able to find a phone number for Larry Trapp. And so he called him and the answering machine answered and it was, you know, this is the KKK and if you'd like to join, leave your name and number. And, and then it was this diatribe against Asians that just went on and on and finally, finally, beep, and the rabbi said, Larry, this is Rabbi Weiser. Please leave my family alone. I don't know why you're targeting me, but there's a lot of love out there, Larry. Goodbye, and he hung up. Well, next thing, he just kind of thought, that was kind of fun. So he started calling this guy, Larry Trapp, every week on Thursdays, every single week. He called him love notes. He called and leave him a message. One time he said, Larry, Larry, there's a lot of love out there, and you're not getting any of it. Another time, he had heard that Larry had advanced diabetes that had caused him to be a double amputee. And so he left a message that said, Larry, why do you love Hitler so much? He would have killed you. And so he kept leaving these love notes until one day Larry answered the phone. Is this that rabbi? Surprised you know, to get him on the phone. Well, yes, it is. Why are you harassing me? And so he stopped for a second and he thought, ooh, I've got a lot of answers to that. <laughs> and it's just breathe, just breathe. Who do I want to be in this moment? And he said, well, Larry, you know, I heard you're disabled and I thought you might need a ride to the grocery store. Big pause. And Larry said, no, I, I've got that covered, but quit calling me. But he didn't quit calling him. He kept calling. But then one Saturday evening, the rabbi's phone rang and he went to pick it up. And it was Larry Trapp on the phone. And Larry said, I want to get out of what I'm doing, but I don't know how. And so the rabbi talked to him. They talked about a lot of things on the phone, and finally he said, I'm going to come over. And of course, his family were scared to death. His son, his teenage son said, Dad, when a Nazi asks you over for dinner, he means you're the dinner. <laughs> but he went, he went over by himself, and when he got to the door, and he opened the door, he said, come in. And so he opened the door. Larry was there in a wheelchair with a shotgun and a pistol and an automatic weapon. And Rabbi Weiser said, I thought, that's it. That's it. I'm out. It was an ambush. But it wasn't. I think Larry was just feeling scared. And he opened up his arms. Larry did. And the rabbi came and hugged him. And he said, I am so sorry about how I've lived my life. And I want to change. And they talked and talked. Larry Trapp told the rabbi about how his father had beaten him all of his childhood, and he was a hateful man. And so he was trying somehow to make his dad proud. And boy, he had outdone himself because he was the grand dragon of Nebraska. But he didn't want to be that anymore. And he and the rabbi over time got to be friends. And then when Larry's health really deteriorated, Rabbi Weiser's wife, Julie, said, we shouldn't abandon him. And they took him in to live with them. So Larry Trapp went to live with the rabbi. And they cared for him. But there was a change in him. He started getting on the phone, writing letters, making amends to as many people as he could. He went to the high school and talked out against racism. He did as much as he could. And he had nine months living there with the rabbi before he died. And when he died, his memorial was held at the synagogue. And there were all these people that came because he had touched a lot of people's lives and he had gotten a lot of love in the end. Jesus says, love your enemies. 
And it isn't going to be easy. He just said, do it. This means love those who make you uncomfortable. Love those who may do things differently. It means love those that irritate you or get on your last nerve. There is no exception. We are to love them all, even the ones who seem intolerant. We're to love them too. Love everybody. But luckily for us, Jesus gives us the grace so that we could do this thing. We can't do it without that. Our human nature is too strong. We are forever being transformed. That's the neat thing about this, is that when we love like that, we are changed. And then the person on the receiving end can be changed as well. And the whole world can be transformed. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have to go move in with the grand dragon of Texas if there is such a person. But who knows where God may lead you? It led a bunch of us to one of the most wonderful experiences of my life in a mosque in Fort Worth, Texas breaking bread with folks who are really different, but who are really wonderful. And I think that that's what America can be. That's what America is about, is all of us coming together and making it work. And I think that's what Jesus was about. So let's be the America we dream of. One Ramadan meal, one kind word, one helpful gesture at a time. Because then we're the people of God. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for this beautiful country that we love. We thank you for all the blessings that are bestowed on us. And we ask that those blessings also be experienced by people here who have less than we do, by people who are struggling to learn English, by people who worship differently, Help us to have the courage to reach out across all those barriers and take their hand and get to know them so that we can be more like you. Show us how to love. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, and I invite you to pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>